What are we having? Uh, it's just your standard regular lunch, I guess. Milk? Soup. Oh, that's apple juice. I can read. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 things you didn't notice in The Breakfast Club. How are we supposed to know? We're not supposed to move, right? For this list, we'll be looking at things viewers may not have seen, recognized, or understood in the celebrated John Hughes film The Breakfast Club. Which of these details went over your head? Let us know in the comments. Number 10. Bender doesn't have a lunch. The Breakfast Club's lunchtime scene is one of the most memorable interactions in a film chock full of iconic moments. While still getting to know one another, the teens dine in the library. What's in there? Guess. Where's your lunch? You're wearing it. You're nauseating. Ever opinionated, Bender reacts strongly to everyone's lunch, whether with a pointed glance or outright mockery. But in the midst of all this judgment, you might have missed the fact that he has no prepared food at all. Well, Brian, this is a very nutritious lunch. All the food groups are represented. Did your mom marry Mr. Rogers? And frankly, this is very telling, as it reflects Bender's unstable home life a source of pain and insecurity for the teen. The scene also exemplifies how he uses his tough guy persona to distract from his own issues. Stupid, worthless, no good goddamn freeloading son of a bitch. Number nine, Allison's delayed start. Brian's memorable letter to Mr. Vernon puts each of the Breakfast Club members into high school stereotypes, from athlete to princess. Can't believe you can't get me out of this. It's so absurd I have to be here on a Saturday. It's not like I'm a defective or anything. This also includes the reclusive basket case Allison. But despite her withholding demeanor, you may be surprised to learn that she only speaks up 24 minutes into the film. And even then, it's to utter a single ha huh, as a mocking response to Claire. Ha! In fact, Allison's first scene with substantial dialogue doesn't occur until a third of the way through the movie. Vodka. When do you drink vodka? Whenever. A lot. Tons. While it's certainly unusual for a film's main character to spend so much time in silence, it was a clever way to capture Allison's one-of-a-kind personality. That's very interesting. Number eight, the library rules. Suffice it to say, the Breakfast Club kids don't always follow the rules. With a bit of a push from Bender, they engage in all sorts of illicit conduct. Yo, Wastoid. You're not gonna blaze up in here. One shot in particular captures the rebellious spirit of youth that pervades the film. While Bender rips apart a book for fun, Brian can be seen next to a sign displaying the library code of conduct. There's a blink and you'll miss it addition to the line that reads, We ask students to please. Love is work. It's a juvenile easter egg that implies that these five teens aren't the only ones who take issue with authority at Shermer High. Mr. Vernon would not be happy about this. You just bought yourself another Saturday, mister. Oh, crushed. You just bought one more right there. Well, I'm free the Saturday after that. Beyond that, I'm gonna have to check my calendar. Good, because it's gonna be filled. Number seven, The Shattering Glass. One of the film's most mystifying sequences finds Andrew in good spirits after smoking marijuana. While his peers relax on the lower floor, Andrew leaves a room filled with smoke, runs a circuit around the library's upper floor, and then shatters the door he came out of. The last moment is a dramatic touch, but perceptive fans may notice that the glass reads foreign language. What does the shattering symbolize? A clue may be found earlier in the film, where Bender memorably tells Andrew, quote, I don't even know your language. Do you think I'd speak for you? I don't even know your language. In this light, the door spontaneously breaking seems to represent social barriers dissolving over the course of the film. The gang has finally found a shared language. Wow. Are you psychic? Number six, the makeup brush. The group really begins to loosen up after Bender's unceremonious return to the library. At one point, the gang even begins looking through each other's belongings. Oh, 
would you mind telling me how you know all this about me? I stole your wallet. As Claire pores over pictures of Bender's love interests, Are all these your girlfriends? He examines the contents of her bag. Hilariously, he uses one of her makeup brushes to clean his teeth while looking in a compact mirror. Although funny, the moment doesn't seem that significant, unless you realize that this brush reappears later in the movie. Yep, it appears to be the same one that Claire uses to do Allison's makeup in the film's final minutes. Number 5. Carl the Janitor was 1969 Man of the Year As Brian reads his essay to Mr. Vernon at the beginning of the film, we get various glimpses of the empty high school. Saturday, March 24th, 1984. Shermer High School. Illinois. In one instance, the camera lands on a Man of the Year plaque. It's here that we see that the 1969 recipient is none other than Carl Reed, the janitor. Of course, first-time viewers have no idea who this is, and may not recognize the character when he's introduced as the school's custodian. Afternoon, Dick. <laughs> hey, Carl. How you doing? Good. Good. What's up? How much? What's happening? What are you doing in the basement files? But with the film's themes including the eternal struggle between youth and authority figures, it's fascinating that Carl has occupied both positions at Shermer High. Perhaps that's why his opinions are so level-headed. And each year, these kids get more and more arrogant. Oh, bullshit, man. Come on, Vern. The kids haven't changed. You have. Number 4. Brian's Locker the film's introductory sequence contains numerous shots that yield interesting details and even foreshadow important plot points. She just has a brain, an athlete, a basket case, a princess, and a criminal. Some of these images correspond to the high school stereotypes that the teens embody, but one in particular doesn't take on significance until far later in the movie. Over Brian's voiceover, we see a damaged and singed locker with the door barely hanging on. This seems to be the aftermath of Brian's accident that landed him in detention. I'm here because Mr. Ryan found a gun in the locker. In the climactic Heart to Heart, the brainy student shares that he was haunted over failing shop class and kept a flare gun in his locker. Unfortunately, it went off by accident, destroying the elephant lamp that he had desperately tried to make work. It was a handgun? It was a flare gun. It went off in my locker. <laughs> Number 3. The Significance of Shermer High School Considering his love of teen movies, it's not exactly surprising that writer-director John Hughes would set many of his projects in or around high schools. Well, well, here we are. But the connections between several of his movies may surprise audience members. A banner in Hughes's Ferris Bueller's Day Off reveals that that film is also set at Shermer High. Although Ferris Bueller's Day Off and The Breakfast Club used different locations for exterior shots, they both shot indoors at Maine North High School in Des Plaines, Illinois. How could I possibly be expected to handle school on a day like this? That isn't all. During a scene in a high school gym, we learn that 1985's Weird Science is also set at Shermer. Oddly enough, that Hughes film also stars Anthony Michael Hall, but not, of course, as Brian. Bang! We hit the city, baby. Dead on. Number 2. John Hughes's Cameo We hear an awful lot about the character's parents in this film. While Bender reveals his father's abuse, for instance, Claire discusses the ways her parents use her against one another. I mean, I don't think either one of them gives a shit about me. It's like they use me just to get back at each other. Although we don't actually see much of them, the little that we do witness is quite revealing. For Brian's part, his mother is clearly a force to be reckoned with. Well, get in there and use the time to your advantage. Mom, we're not supposed to study. We just have to sit there and do nothing. Well, mister, you figure out a way to study. Yeah. But his father doesn't even have a speaking role. And this might be because writer-director John Hughes actually plays the Johnson patriarch. It isn't his only cameo role in his own work, but it's one of the most surprising. See you next Saturday. That's it. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Andrew Flips Mr. Vernon Off 
Although the teams have their fair share of animosity throughout the day, there's no question who the true antagonist is. Are you through? No. I'm doing society a favor. So? That's another one right now. I've got you for the rest of your natural born life. If you don't watch your step, you want another one? Yes. You got it! Vice Principal Richard Vernon has clear disdain for his students and truly relishes dishing out detention time to Bender. He's even caught snooping through students' private records by the bemused school janitor. Oh, Mr. Tierney, a history of slight mental illness. <laughs> Although Bender most obviously stands up to Vernon, there's a moment when Andrew quietly shows his rebellious side too. After an awkward attempt at helping the administrator prop open the library door, he subtly gives the latter the finger. Although it's quite a shocking gesture, it's subtle enough that many viewers have missed it. Eat. My. Shorts. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.